Welcome to the Gotham Outsiders, our first episode of The Better Cut, our podcast special about the movies we watched, how we would make them better if we had the chance to remake them. Today, I am a girl who can't live on psychoses alone. I'm your host, Chris, a bad obsessive. And seeing Dick Grayson's ass in every Rorschach test, my co-host, TJ. It's everywhere. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I am TJ, your Chris proclaimed Batman acolyte. But we can't navigate this terrifying neon circus that is life alone, so we brought in a guest, PhD programmer, comics writer, and GLAAD Award nominee, Anthony Oliveira! Hello, hi. To cert what is it she says? Certified wacko? That let's go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the technical term, certified right. wacko. Right. I am not sure about <laughs> Chase Meridian's practice. Um <laughs> Chase Meridian may have got her PhD in psychology from like Phoenix Online. I'm just throwing right. it out. Chris, I knew you were gonna have a lot to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's no secret that I am a huge Marvel fan and I love your work over there, uh, specifically with Emperor Hulkling. Congratulations on your GLAAD nomination. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. The behind the scenes of this is that uh, the hosts literally caught me singing Kiss from a Rose as we were coming into the <laughs> <laughs> It was the greatest so thing we've ever caught a guest doing. <laughs> That's all right, Anthony. So he's definitely my... a Batman Forever fan. Um, <laughs> yeah. You follow my Stan Twitter account, so we're even. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know there was another one. It's such a good <laughs> fan Twitter account. Um, uh, and we're talking about like one of my literal favorite movies, like 1997. This was it, yes. Batman Forever. Oh, wow. See, I was. Yeah. I was not born when this came out. How okay. dare you? I am I leaving. This is this interview is over. <laughs> it he, predates he me by the, about a year. He is the actual infant on this show. <laughs> wow. So you yeah. didn't live through the like media blitz that was this movie. Like I literally, while I was watching this, I was like, why am I having the world's biggest craving for McDonald's? And then I remembered. <laughs> that that was the whole campaign that you got the little glasses that I still have of like the two-face handle where the like the, the mug handle is the flipping coin oh gosh. or the Riddler one where it's his like Riddler cane it's like this was the I... thing like the toyeticness of this movie was what it was all about <laughs> what an effective marketing campaign yeah <laughs> years I know it's 20, later. <laughs> 24 years later and I'm like damn I need a happy meal <laughs> Wow. See, I missed all that, but I grew up watching it though because yes. I was in my childhood prime, um, like a year or two after Batman and Robin. So mm -hmm. I've really watched uh, the Joel Schumacher films a lot as a kid. I did too. So I haven't seen this movie since I was a kid. So this was quite an experience, oh, wow. I will say. What? Yeah. what kind of Batman podcast is this? <laughs> I know, right? I rewatched it a few weeks ago and then of course revisited it right. uh, more recently. But before then I hadn't seen it since I was a kid either. Right. Wow. So I how know. does it how does it handle like how does it stand up when it's <sighs> not like the thing that is baked into your DNA? Like, well, it still right. is though. So that's the difference. It was from my yeah. childhood and it's been, you know a long time since then but I g genuinely put it on and I was like uh yes like it felt like sinking back into my childhood and just I, it, had, I loved it I had the music <laughs> memorized and like the first <laughs> couple opening scenes I knew like every beat every word of dialogue I was really surprised yes uh, yeah it's boiling acid <laughs> <laughs> I'll get drive through can we <laughs> Can we talk about that guard? I feel like I should not have this many notes about a nameless guard in the very first scene. He has a lot scene. of personality. He does. He um, only wants that, his hearing aid. His hearing aid. He, that he loses man. his hearing aid. He loses his glasses. He's really going through it. Like, See, that man was like, I have one scene in this movie, so I'm going to act a movie's worth in that one scene. <laughs> he was very cute. He was having a bad day. Yeah, he it's was, not a fun day. Like he really set the tone for the whole movie is what I'm saying and I love it. <laughs> it's a great opener. This like opening scene, there was supposed to be a different scene that opened the film um, and they cut it and they were like, you know what? Let's just cut straight to the robbery scene. And it like, it definitely is like, listen, this is going to be a different kind of movie. Like the physics are not quite the physics of the universe you right. live in. It's like right. a live action cartoon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like... this movie is really... 
proclaiming itself to be like the successor to the Batman 66 TV show. Yeah. Right? Like, yes. yes. Yeah, it has it's the gonna, taste, um, the campiness, yes. the, like, mm-hmm. um, the sincerity, despite the campiness, like the <laughs> yeah. mix of sincerity and campiness. Really, Val the most Kilmer, important thing like, about camp is the sincerity, yes, right? And absolutely. Val Kilmer is kind of perfect in this movie. I was so surprised to see that. He was just like, I don't know how he had a straight face in any of these scenes, but he <laughs> just did and i loved it i was he like was good yes he just you guys didn't think break. he's the sexiest batman or no did you say the sexiest i did say the sexiest oh um hmm. well as That's the tough. as as the asexual on the podcast i'm obviously qualified <laughs> to be the one to answer and yes <laughs> Like, actually, I was watching it and I was yeah. like, wow, the aesthetic. <laughs> he's very yeah. cute. And the glasses, like. He's, he's also the f- most 90s face you've ever seen in your life. Right? Oh, yeah. He, he looks also- like um, Riley's older brother from, like, Buffy the Vampire. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I mean, the interesting way you posed it is, like, like to me, George Clooney is the sexiest dude of the bunch. Right, but he's but not he- a Batman. He's not, right. like, he's a summer and Batman is a winter, you know? <laughs> He is the sexiest bat dad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is Chris O'Donnell is in this movie talking about 90s faces. (laughs) Talk about sexy Chris O'Donnell. That laundry Uh, scene. What is he supposed Is he supposed to be a teenager or is he supposed to be? He has to be. (laughs) The way they talked about him. The whole movie, I was like, how old is he supposed to be? Which I obviously <laughs> looked up, he was 25 because I okay. knew we were gonna have this conversation and I was like, we need to, <laughs> we need to- like, They're like, he almost was in the foster age. system. And I'm like, yeah, he, he is there's no way. Yeah, he is simultaneously <laughs> a minor who owns a motorcycle, is also a college right. student, but like will become a ward <laughs> of the state if, if he does I was so- <laughs> Oh, yeah. Was that like? I mean, I know that you know, no teenager has ever been played by a teenager. I do know that. But, but was come it on. was it intentional for him to look older because of all the it, the gayness in the movie? It has to be. I just yeah, want to know. Like to be. That's probably one element of it. Is like we live in the long shadow of like the seduction of the innocent is yeah. probably happening here. Um, but also but, like the movie wants to like delight in how he looks right like that's yes. an important element mm. of the film but it does sort of weaken it does weaken the robin origin if it's like okay yes. dude it's sad but you're like you're 30 like you have a mortgage <laughs> <laughs> get over it <laughs> parents die i mean they don't all die the in mortgage. a splatter at, at the circus but it happens you know like which i mean same to bruce though get over it <laughs> <laughs> even more to bruce my gosh right. yeah <laughs> It also really clouds uh, the issue of like, what is the nature of this relationship, right? Like, you're not you really his when dad. They say, <laughs> you right. mean when they say we're not friends, we're partners in this very right. significant way? It might yeah. cloud some people's judgment of what this relationship is. Yeah, there's is. definitely a capital P on partner there. <laughs> and you're <laughs> right. Like, he doesn't feel like a dad. He does, no. He's like older brother-ish, maybe. Maybe, But yeah. like, it's very open to interpretation, I think. Right. right. Alfred well, I mean, is both of their dads. That's what's happening. Course, in here. Right. Unless, of course, you're Joel Schumacher, in which the nature of this relationship is very clear, right? Like, this is, <laughs> this is like an older daddy and like a new to this yes. gay dude who's like, right. you know, live in your, like, he's he's the pool boy, is what he is. Right? <laughs> yeah. To so, me, like, he, the scene of him like trying to get into the Batcave and like being curious of it felt like, I mean, if we're looking at being a superhero as like a mm-hmm. metaphor of having another, like a second life, you know, yeah, when you're gay, you kind of have that. And like, I was reading into it as like, oh, like this could be another younger queer person. Like, oh my gosh, I found someone like me. I want to, I want to know this person. You right. mean there might be some symbolism of him going through a literal closet and finding a secret <laughs> identity? <laughs> Could be gay, but I always be. say that. How could it be gay? There's no reason. No. <laughs> it's uh, so subtle. <laughs> and that laundry scene, I know we just mentioned it, but so hot. Uh, Confusingly so hot, because it's like, why is this hot? Like it's and Alfred is like ogling him. <laughs> looks a little bit like he's like why are you doing this for me this is not for me (laughs) i felt like alfred was mean that moment right yeah it's like the gray sweatpants the bare feet the like he was shook yeah it's a lot (laughs) 
Al- Alfred was questioning some things about himself he'd never questioned before. <laughs> 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 Flashbacks to like World War II <laughs> yeah. <and> trenches. Yeah. <laughs> Those cold nights. <laughs> My buddy playing on the soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> He's just quietly like, maybe we weren't just bunk mates. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the gayest thing in this film is Jim Carrey as the Oh Ripper. my oh my gosh. gosh. Like, okay, so you you, you both just rewatched this with fresh yes. eyes. Like it is actually yes. and I'm not even joking here, right? Like it is not subtext it is the it's not subtext right like edward nigma is in love with bruce wayne i yes he 100 percent. like (laughs) yes everything about this character i mean queer coded doesn't even seem remotely like enough to say (laughs) right nigma this week so Mm -hmm. you know you mentioned i haven't seen this movie since i was a literal child and at that point did not know i was queer but i'm on this interesting journey of revisiting all the stuff from my childhood and discovering that the signs were there all along (laughs) Mm -hmm. everything i loved (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> everything i loved as a kid i just have been revisiting disney channel original movies and discovering my favorite ones are all very gay and watching lord of the rings and it's very gay and i'm like <laughs> right. wow i think there's a there's a connection <laughs> like bruce describes it as a love letter that he's received edward is like mimicking him 100%. with the mole and everything it's very yes. clear that drew barrymore is here only as his beard, right? A hundred percent. I love her though. I'm like, she was giving every, like her lines weren't that great, but every line she made great. Like uh-huh. she was eating it up. Mm-hmm. She what? Like everyone in this movie. I honestly don't think anyone was half doing it in this one. Cause sometimes you watch That's movies fair. that are this camp and there's like one person who clearly is not committing. Uh-huh. There's no one in this movie who isn't just going like, yes, I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> they were all in right <laughs> they're all the actors that arrived at disney world in this movie. It's, it's like <laughs> what it is right it's like a roller coaster of a movie it um, is and i know oh. we, we talked about jim carrey a little like yes, he's please, just let's. so good like i almost feel like his performance is on par with like robin williams as the genie with like mm. all the impressions and just so expressive and funny and i and i got to a point in my notes where i was like i cannot talk about jim <laughs> without all caps i just can't yeah. do it <laughs> i got it to a point in my notes where i stopped writing down my favorite of his lines because it, it was like this is all the notes at this point right. or just Every my favorite line. his line they're so good and it's it hard so to funny. tell what's on the page and what's him like it's hard mm-hmm. to see i was listening to the dvd commentary and schumacher said that um, Jim Carrey would literally let him he would do 50 takes if Schumacher oh let him gosh. like he would come in every day with like a book of notes about how he wanted to do every little minor expression he's yeah. clearly like literally been training with that cane right like yeah oh <laughs> my gosh god okay <laughs> <laughs> that um, cane amazing <laughs> Love yeah. it. he has so many it's you kind of forget how many outfits the Riddler right. has in this movie right They're all gorgeous <laughs> He, all his Lady Gaga outfits. Yeah. No, I was like, he is like, he is like a gay Pokemon. He keeps leveling up, like every yeah. time we see him. Yeah, it goes from like the suit that he steals from the the mannequin, right, to like that final sequin eleganza yes. extravaganza moment with the glitter about, on his okay. mole. I Has love somebody it. done a drag in that costume yet? Because I oh. feel like <laughs> it would be amazing. Well, uh, that's what it is. It's a drag performance. The whole, it is. the mm-hmm. whole thing is just, um, and I yeah. mean the gender play too, right? Like, yes. wow, like the the two face stuff is so weird. Like it's, <laughs> there is kind of a closety narrative where it's like he's been quietly obsessed with Bruce Wayne, and it erupts <laughs> yeah. into this sort of camp performance that is the Riddler. Yep. yep that's true yeah if we're we're talking about our journeys with this movie i've said many times in this podcast the riddler is one of my favorite villains and then ended with you know i don't know why and i went back to this movie and i'm like okay i get it (laughs) i feel like so many people shit on this like this movie in general but specifically jim carrey in this movie but he's so good like if you go in knowing what kind of movie this is he's he's the best part in my it's like some people watch it and don't think he knows what like he he doesn't know what he's doing and it's like how could you watch this and not see it as intentional i'm so confused (laughs) i think that this is again you guys are too young maybe to remember this but Hmm. this movie 1997 was a very 
different <laughs> online world in particular. Like it was literally the, the news cycle and especially geek culture were dominated by websites like Ain't It Cool News, which were all about the kind of Snydery, hyper-masculine mm. aesthetic. Like they wanted mm -hmm. boobs and they wanted grit. And something that is so, I mean, famously, this movie, if you want to, like, if people know nothing about this, the meme they remember is the nipples on the bat suit, right? Like, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that is such a specifically, I wrote about the nipples on the bat suit before. <laughs> <laughs> nipples on the bat suit are dropping the mask, right? Because, like, yes. men want the hyper masculine fantasy of muscles. But if you put nipples on, it's like, oh, this is about sensitivity. This is about desire, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. And that's this whole movie is like, we're yes. going to have fun and it's going to be pretty gay. And yeah. that's why the whole world like rejected it. Like that's yeah. why we, like, we cannot enjoy this publicly. Um, and yeah. that, Batman and Robin only made it worse, right? That's fair. I just read The Caped Crusade by Glenn Weldon, which goes into that a lot about just mm -hmm. how people, basically people weren't ready for it. Like well, that. I mean, the other thing is that um, the thing that, geek culture in particular didn't want to admit is how queer geek culture was yeah right? like nerd like i've been going to comic cons for 25 years now mm -hmm. and what's been funny is watching the way the queerness of artists alley which is the fan yes. response things has started to seep into like the big two mm -hmm. and like i mean I, I say that as someone who is <laughs> trying to do that same kind of work but like <laughs> like I've always said like, I don't really understand what straight people get from superheroes. Cause it is such a, <laughs> it is such a queer narrative. Like it is, like you said, like yeah. Robin literally like flying into the closet and with like silverware clattering everywhere. Like, <laughs> that's that's a just a great point. point, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Straight people write us. What do you know? Right. Please don't actually. Like, <laughs> see, my people, what do you think <laughs> Batman is about? <laughs> Uh, boobs straight, and grit, straight. obviously. <laughs> I was gonna say, just, just kidding. They're not listening to this one. <laughs> See, superhero <laughs> movies was one of the things as a kid, one of the only things as a kid that I bonded with my dad over, who's mm. like a very mask man. Um, mm. So like, it, it's, it's so funny that like superheroes have been such a fundamental thing, a part of my queerness growing up as a kid and still today. And like, yeah. that it, you know, it just something very ironic to me sure the last yeah. sight of um explicitly desirable male bodies right like in film right like because mm -hmm. you're not allowed like what does an action hero look like now it's like bruce willis like i don't know <laughs> like, who's allowed to who is allowed to be hot as a man is an interesting question hmm. and to me it feels like even look at today like chris evans like chris evans hmm. the chris's, the chris's right? is. like yeah, yeah. Like that's where we're putting male desire and it, it's not an act, like superhero comics, superhero movies. It's like, look at those muscles. Imagine what those muscles can do. It's the last place you're allowed to do that. Now, are you a defender of the bat nipples, Anthony? I feel like there's a space for the bat nipples. I feel like they <laughs> wouldn't work in the comics. <laughs> yeah. I feel like comic books need less detail. And when you bring something to film, mm -hmm. it always adds detail and that's sort of sort of like very fussy way all the marvel comic movies they all have these like weird little asymmetrical belts and stuff mm. um i love the bat nipples because to me it looks like oh you're doing a roman armor thing right like you're yeah. doing that same kind of and this is a movie about male camaraderie right like whether or not yes. whether or not you read it as a sexual <laughs> dynamic it is literally about batman and this young man who he's going to initiate into the rights of superhero dumb right like what it's about and as soon as you put that nipple on there it's like oh yeah like the romans right like that's the shorthand mm. yeah the romans a totally straight group of people <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there's a part at the end where they're like he's like alfred are all the suits destroyed and alfred's like we have that one suit left sir with the nipples <laughs> <laughs> right. and he's right. like oh great but I that's feel like we back, need like Achilles and Patroclus. That's yes. like the sacred band of Thebes, right? That's the seventh circle of hell where Dante's like, what's going on here? And he's like, this is where the homosexuals are. And there's like the really gay <laughs> ones. But then there's the soldiers who come running over. Like there's, it, it's just part of the culture, yeah. right? Like the gym rat yeah. culture aspect is all over this movie. Yeah. I do <laughs> love the idea. So as we know that Alfred made all these suits of him like, carefully crafting nipples onto his surrogate son's costume. Right. 
<laughs> oh my do you think he like got like a clay mold and like Oh Bruce my gosh. walks out at some point is just like what? what? <laughs> uh, right, yeah. It's also it's my... super weird in the next one where it's like I made you this, my niece, and it's like what? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, it's true. And now, Anthony, amazing. you watched the commentary. Did was there any comment on like the close-ups while they're changing suits? He he knows right off the top. He talks about the nipples actually in Schumacher. <laughs> And he's like, I did not know this was going to be a big thing. I think people need to get out more, is what he says. <laughs> and that speaks Aww. really to his whole... I love it. I've, I, R.I.P. Joel Schumacher, who I really love mm -hmm. um, as a filmmaker. I love Phantom of the Opera. I love his aesthetic. Yes. I love his eye. Um, he does not shy away from camp, but he's also like one of the last, really, of the superhero movies that were allowed to have a sexualized component right mm. like i can't mm. think of anything more aggressively mm. unsexy than the nolan movies right like they're the <laughs> yeah. most and i don't even mean that in a mean yeah, way it's yeah. just christopher yeah. nolan has a very chilly eye right like he is yes. not interested he's interested in like these weird dead wives and these like yeah. sexlessly unemotionally available men um, mm -hmm. in very geometric shapes and that's like that's and really for good better point. or worse for 10 years that defined what a superhero was and um Joel Schumacher was sort of the last to be like aren't men pretty to look at right like, yeah. that's, that's such a good point I know yeah. I'm just going through my like mental list of Nolan movies and I'm like wow they are sexless what on earth <laughs> it's just they're very yeah. frigid they love they are. you couldn't at a, at a very basic visual level, they have a look to them, but at a story level too. It's like, mm -hmm. my wife is dead. I must protect my child. My wife is kind mm -hmm. of back again, but oh no, she's like this demon. Like that's kind of how all the movies go. And it's, you that's know a it. Good point. It's... And like my question earlier of who is the sexiest Batman, like in my mind, I'm, I'm such a big Dark Knight fan. Um, I, Christian Bale is like, if I had to think of someone as Batman in live action, I usually go to him just naturally for me. Uh, Cause that's what I grew up with. But I was like, mm -hmm. is he sexy to me? And I was like, he's good looking, but I don't find him he sexy. He fuck, right? Oh, I don't know if you right. yeah. can like, I swear? I don't think I can oh, swear. Yeah. But if we oh, had yeah. Joel Schumacher <laughs> making the Dark Knight movie, maybe oh, yeah. I would have found him very sexy. I don't know. <laughs> I suspect you would have. Cause yeah. I was thinking, I was like, yeah, Christian Bale is a handsome man in many movies, but you're right. right. I don't think it's in that one. Like hmm. you can watch him, like watch Velvet Under, uh, what is it? Velvet Goldmine, right? Like. Yeah. Christian Bale, very sexy, getting, is he getting fucked in that movie? I forget. Was it Ewan <laughs> McGregor who's fucking him? Anyway, gay sex, go watch it. Um, but yes. like you put him, <laughs> you put him in a Christopher Nolan movie and it's like, this Batman is definitely sexually dysfunctional, right? Like yeah. he has to be. There's yeah. no way he's not. <laughs> Whereas yeah. like, yeah, you know, you can do some hand stuff with uh, <laughs> Batman Forever. <laughs> Well, there's one person who finds Val Kilmer sexier than we do, shockingly, and that is Chase Meridian. Oh my, goodness. my God. Yeah. There has never been a thirstier person <laughs> than Chase Meridian. I who can't said believe some it. Deeply concerning things for a therapist. To Black say. rubber. Uh. <laughs> she's like, she's like, there's a scene where she goes, I'm attracted to the wrong kind of guy. Just look what I do for a living. And I was like, ma'am, are you attracted to your clients? <laughs> ma'am. <laughs> I like that she also is like, not more complicated than horny for Batman, you know? Like, <laughs> right. it is sort of undisguised and like, she's aggressive. Schumacher yeah. talks about how the big note they got from women over 50 was that she was too horny. And he's like, you know mm. what? We're leaving it. <laughs> Yeah, she's so shameless about it. I like her shamelessness. I would have liked her mm -hmm. to have a personality, but you know, that's right. just me. Right. <laughs> just that rooftop scene, I couldn't believe it yeah. was real. Can we talk about the bat signal booty call? My God. <laughs> in like that flouncy number she's in? God yeah. damn. Yeah. Yeah. What if poor Gordon had showed up because there was a bat signal? And he was just like, "Oh, what does he think? What does he think he's arrived? Like, what is he interrupted when he comes? He's like, I saw the lights on. It's like, oh, okay. and he's he's just like, this is not what this is for. You two, come on. Right. But again, speaking to the queerness, like the Riddler also uses the bat signal to summon Batman. Yes. 
there's a it's weird so and then he it's literally that triangle where he's like which one will you pick the woman <laughs> or the man and it's like what <laughs> is it really about oh <laughs> I know Riddler come on bisexuality exists Batman says and then catches them both I think it speaks volumes that like people complained that oh this was too gay but we have scenes like this with Chase Meridian and it, like I was watching this movie as a five-year-old child um my parents didn't think anything about it now if someone had told them it was gay they yeah. wouldn't have let me watch it right that's really true yeah but even her desire even the way she looks at him is like in its own weird like she looks at him with the male gaze right like yes Yes. have you i don't know if you've ever seen that that manipulation that people did on the internet where they switched the video game batman and selena oh yeah Um, you see what i'm talking about where they turn the like male gaze on batman and the female gaze you know on selena and it's so different and it's fascinating i love she is that (laughs) she's just that (laughs) but she's also weird and like oh she's so weird like she has a personality we just don't see it you know like yeah what really is her deal like there is something even the way you're talking about how she's like wildly unprofessional is kind of fascinating right (laughs) <laughs> she ha- she works in this extremely weird building with her giant gothic doors that he has right, to knock down. Yeah. <laughs> Who would so you know the idea of therapy is to create a space people feel comfortable. And I'm looking at this room and I'm like, who does she do therapy on? Like gargoyles? Like and her punching bag? <laughs> Don't forget her that. <laughs> I was just, who is this woman and then she has like she's making like a collage of batman faces so there's like stuff going on is what i'm saying she's got some stuff she feels like she is like about to be the villain of the next one you know right. like, like absolutely like a... <laughs> she yeah she is just one rejection away from like joining riddler yeah. and being like you were right yeah, she could like, i mean harley quinn she could have you know uh, yeah she you're not wrong. she's sort of yeah she is harley quinn of Ana Letra, right like she has mm. that's a good um, point a lot of her qualities a lot of her obsessed like she's basically one bad day and an OSHA violation away from like, being <laughs> super. Can you villain. imagine Batman and Robin? Like, no, Mister Freeze, keep Poison Ivy, but bring back Chase oh. Meridian as like a Harley Quinn uh, that would reinterpretation. Be and that's we discover fascinating that- better. She's like a complete OC, right? Like she yeah. is made for this movie because the writers were like, all of Batman's love interests are like socialites, and that's boring. <laughs> so they like created this woman who like. Even Batman's like when she what does she say that he's a total wacko like she, yeah. yeah he's like is that a technical term and then she gives him let me note a term that is also not technical right <laughs> where she's like he's not obsessive with homicidal tendencies and I was like that's not a dying okay we'll move on it's fine <laughs> I do love her uh, like I I do kind of love her too I'm not yeah. gonna lie I think a lot of it is just um Nicole Kidman's performance and, uh, and her voice is, is just on, so sultry all the time. She is a full on snack in this movie. Like she <laughs> looks amazing. <laughs> you know what's amazing? I was, as I said, listening to the commentary track and the biggest fight mm-hmm. he had in studios was that they thought Nicole Kidman when they cast her wasn't sexy enough. And then he showed what? them the- Excuse me? Yeah, and then he, sh- he was like, what? And then he showed them the rushes and they were like, oh, okay, never mind." <laughs> They said more boobs, them, more grit. He showed them the rushes and they had to take a shower and then they were like, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, she's just she's on 11. In this movie. Ex- like, oh, you just yes. want to take a hose to her, like, man, <laughs> you are in a professional setting. <laughs> Yes, when he goes to consult with her as a therapist and she does not yet know he's Batman, but she's still like, you know, if you took me now, I'd be fine with right. the attitude. But you're just like, And then she goes on a date with him. And then she goes on a date with him. I really want to be like, ma'am, have you, be honest, have you slept with one of your clients? Just, just tell us. We probably need to know. I, I love the fact that like, she wants Batman and Bruce wants her and she's like, I don't want you, I want Batman. And then when Batman wants her, she's like, I don't want you, I want Bruce. Like, I respect that. I love it too. And I guess the character we haven't talked about is Two-Face, who is kind of the embodiment of that dual identity thing. Um, That is so wild. I do kind of, at first I wasn't sure I was going to enjoy this take on Two-Face until they just leaned so hard in that I was on board. When they got to his lair. Weird way. He is really? kind of like a henchman to me. Like, yeah. 
Like, I, think, it is, I guess it's the scene in his lair that made me love him where it's literally <laughs> split down the middle and it's like it looks like he's trying to recreate pictures of heaven on one side and then he's got like the hellfire club on the other side yeah with the the boar like turning on a spit and, and can we appreciate <laughs> the one girl got him raw donkey meat <laughs> yeah like, what yeah. is happening tj as a an official harvey fucker of this podcast how how does this one rank on your list of Harveys that you would you would be down for? See, he was the thing I was least interested in in this movie, yeah. surprisingly. Um, so I don't I don't have very many thoughts on him. So the fact that Anthony is talking about um, the dual personality like mm-hmm. metaphor, I find that very interesting because it went way over my head when watching. Well, he's just not interesting as everything else I think is part of it. Right. And the film to it, the film knows it's not interested in him, right? Like flashback to his origin, mm-hmm. he's like literally in the middle of the robbery at the beginning, the coins, mm-hmm. he's flipping the coin until he gets the result he wants, which is not Harvey Dent at all, right? Like right. he's mm-hmm. kind of the, the, the cartoon had just done the most interesting version of Harvey Dent I had ever seen. Yeah in the animated series where it's like the two-parter that's like that morose oboe playing throughout. I just watched that episode. It's so good, isn't it? Like it is such a beautiful, it's definitely top five of that series. And this is definitely not that, right? There is no No. tears for Harvey Dent in this movie. (laughs) Yeah, because we really don't get it. I mean, other than Bruce, at one point he says to Bruce that they used to be best friends. We don't really get a sense of how people felt about Harvey before this, with Mm -hmm. the exception of the one scene where uh, Bruce is longingly looking at images of him on the screen, which I did (laughs) note, where he's just like, (laughs) just runs a slow hand down it and is like, Harvey. (laughs) Well, And there's a part near the end where like, Dick is like, I can't promise I won't kill him. And Bruce is just like, I support you. Right. And it's like, what? <laughs> what? Right. So, Bruce is, uh, Bruce's Batman role is a little uh, loosey-goosey in this movie. <laughs> sure. He spends 90 <laughs> minutes being like, you, you mustn't kill him. And he fully kills right. him at the end. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know. I was not expecting him to just yeah. full on die. And it's then like, he, Robin he tripped. It, it was him. It wasn't yeah. me. And then Robin <laughs> smiles about it. And I'm like, wait. <laughs> Yeah. Can we talk about the personality of Dick Grayson and how it is Jason Todd? Because <laughs> that's yeah. true. It's very Jason Todd, right? It has nothing to do really with like the Nightwing Dick Grayson right. persona at all. It I gets, did love but the ex- Nightwing uh, the Easter yeah, that Easter egg. Yeah, that was cute. I caught that too. But it is interesting that they, you know, obviously they choose to make it Dick Grayson because uh, like everything else chooses to make it Dick Grayson. So that's the one people know. But it is interesting that they just completely take Jason's personality and do it really well, I think, overall. Yeah. But it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just not Dick. <laughs> yeah. But like, I'm it, trying to remember timeline wise, was there even a Tim Drake yet? When does Tim Drake show up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was. This would have been late 80s. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so we already have three in three in the in the tank already. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's you very know, it's a very nineties type of personality in general, right? True. Like, uh, this, his like, earring and his oh motorcycle. God, his earring. And we keep and talking about earring, how on but... Young Justice, um, that version of Dick is basically just Tim. So it's like, okay, right. when are we gonna get a Dick adaptation that is Dick? Yeah, right. it's true. Or, or just any of them that actually have the personalities they're supposed to have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a real, there's a real like Matryoshka doll thing happening with the Robins where it's like, like the nerds on this podcast, we know the deal, but the public, <laughs> if I asked the public about the Robins, I'd be interested to know what right. the average person thinks. Like, I don't yeah. think the world has any sense of Tim Drake as a character. Most of the time, because we have had a few people on the show that didn't really know Batman, when we ask them about the Robins, it's usually like Robins, like multiple. (laughs) (laughs) What do you mean? (laughs) Right. Don't call me out from that first episode. (laughs) I was getting ready to say for it since TJ when we started. (laughs) Yeah, it's always difficult. And like, like Stephanie, like there's always this thing where it's like, oh, misogyny. It's like, there's definitely misogyny baked into it, but also just the public literally doesn't know yeah. about her, right? Like, yeah. she's never been in anything. So there is a kind of way where this movie's adaptation of Robin, it reads very it reads very Jason Todd to us, but it's also yeah. like, 
what if you watched the 60s TV show and we're like, okay, what's that character like in the 90s? Mm-hmm. And he kind of is just Jason Todd. Yeah, I, I guess it's, you know, to me, it's kind of like, you know, we were talking about the Nolan movies at one point who that have a Robin in it that's fully just a different Robin. Right, right. Like, right. right just, just a new one. So I feel like it wouldn't, I don't think that the casual fan would care if this, if you called this character Jason instead of Dick. Like, I don't think anybody's, caring when we're out here having you know joseph gordon levitt robin is just named robin that's his name <laughs> right and it's like at the end of the movie while you're leaving the theater it's like what okay yeah, I like yeah. he's like by the way my real name is robin and i yeah. was like the fuck <laughs> you, that shitty thing my... that movies did for a few ta- for a few years like the same thing happens with um talia in that movie right yes. it's like, okay i guess you're talia and then all of a sudden the camera cuts and she's like fully in like this like orientalist costume all of a sudden mm-hmm. it's like you were a french lady a second ago <laughs> what we- does that- <laughs> i love the scene well i loved it as a kid specifically and i think mm. i've mentioned this before uh when dick steals the batmobile and yeah. saves the girl and she just says doesn't batman ever kiss the girl and there's that music and they kiss uh it made me tingle as a child for certain reasons oh meanwhile i'm over there going like how old is he how old is she is this lethal? <laughs> i'm not sure <laughs> see i have fond memories of it <laughs> he has a driver's license that's i know how old is she <laughs> oh, yeah. like she was 14 anyway <laughs> well yeah <laughs> I think I remember that they used to say that, I mean, this was again, back in the rumor days, everyone was like, that girl's going to be Batgirl in the next one. It's like, I don't think so. <laughs> she, I mean, she looks similar to Alicia Silverstone though. Cause there was a yeah. moment where I was like, wait, what? And then I was like, yeah. oh no, this is just some random girl. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he has a type. Dick, <laughs> Dick, I mean, Dick has a type. Yes, <laughs> yes, I got that. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Yeah, I'm not sure she's Joel <laughs> Schumacher's type. <laughs> Let's just go on live. <laughs> Did you guys have a favorite uh, Riddler line in this movie? Oh, Ooh. yeah, I do. Which it's, one? It's almost his last line where he says, was that over the top? I can never tell. <laughs> that was the one I was going to say too. I, it's uh, perfect. I also am a big fan of his join us in a celebration of absolute chaos because that is this movie's tagline, if anything <laughs> is. Like, yeah. <laughs> See, I just love his deliveries. The, why can't I kill you? Yes. <laughs> it's so good. Is the most. Uh, and the surf's up, big kahuna. <laughs> All the business in the bat cave is great, where he's like throwing it's, bombs. Uh, oh, the other good line I really like is tell the fat lady she's on in five. I think that's really good. Oh, <laughs> Amazing. I love that he puts his arm around Harvey and is like, you'll have post-homicide depression. <laughs> Oh, and his tears. Yeah. See, someone saw the mask and was like, "Just do that." Yeah, that but riddles. I mean, the other he thing also- is like he's also doing the Frank Gorshin Riddler, right? Like, mm-hmm. there's this weird way that I've kind of always liked, and maybe you guys have talked about on this show, but there's a weird way that the Joker and the Riddler are kind of too proximate mm-hmm. sometimes, right? Like, <laughs> they're too. There's a great scene in the animated series where. Um, Joker, I think it's in the um, Mad Love where the Joker's looking at plans. And he's like, two Riddler. Like, there's, <laughs> and there's a way that the Frank Gorshin Riddler is actually the most perfect version of the Joker. And there's yeah. also a way that like, it's kind of a shame we never got the Jim Carrey Joker, but then I don't know if they're different, you know? Like, <laughs> right, that's, that's fair, huh? Yeah. So what did you guys think of the riddles themselves in the movie? Like the actual ones that he tells? Yeah, because I they're, the clock one had me rolling. <laughs> I was going to say, they're a lot simpler than what I'm used to for him in the comics. We did a few episodes back a game where I had TJ and the guests try to figure out the Riddler's um, riddles from the comics. And they are just impossible. They make no sense at all. Right. So this, this was like, oh, a riddle you can solve. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> You know, the girl that was with Bruce when they got the clock riddle, and she's like, what does it mean? And I'm like, you dumb bitch. What is wrong with you? <laughs> she um, was under stress. <laughs> right. I like that it has a good balance of like, the other thing is with the Riddler, it's like, you do want to pitch it for kids, especially this movie, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's a good balance of like, oh, you could solve that one. You can appreciate that one. And then the ending where he does the impossible 1960s thing where he's like, Mr. E, Edward Nigma, right? Like, oh, yeah. 
There's the I impossible know. leap at the end. I what think, would yeah. he have done if his name wasn't Edward Nigma? I like we just will never know. <laughs> See, um, I approached it from I could solve this. This person's an idiot if they can't solve it. <laughs> but that's perennial. Like as a writer, I'm always thinking like, what if they made me write the Riddler? Mm. It's like they talk about it a lot with the animated series. The reason the Riddler is in very few episodes of the animated series is that he's very hard to write because it's so much work to figure out his plans. One of my favorite adaptations of the Riddler so far is in the DC Superhero Girls, which is for sort of like a middle grade cartoon where they have made the Riddler into a like milady nice guy in middle school. Oh, that's smart. It's so funny. He's like, has a huge crush on Batgirl and he's like always trying to be like, I'm a nice guy. And it's, oh my gosh, it's good. It's very good. I feel like this movie, I don't, you guys probably didn't have this thought. Um, Hmm. I feel like this movie just shows that Jim Carrey was like born to be in a Ryan Murphy show, whether that be like (laughs) Scream Queens or Glee. (laughs) Was he never on Glee? If you just tell me he was on Glee, I'd believe it at this point. I'd be like, okay. (laughs) Seems right. see, if you asked me to cast the Riddler today, I would go Hmm. to Max Greenfield who did who was on one of the he was on which one the hotel one or something but he's like one of those perennial ryan murphy character he's the he's schmidt from new girl right like that yes Yes! that's the kind of over the top you need to have that level of energy to play this kind of riddler but i can also get behind like the quiet cerebral ones so i don't know i I feel like how do you feel about the one that's coming out of curiosity the riddler we're getting in the new movie oh who's playing him it's uh what's his name isn't it um yes what is his name (laughs) is it paul dano is paul dano playing i think it is i completely (laughs) forgot he was going to be in that movie Oh, really? I was thinking about yeah. the whole time. I was like, oh, yeah, we're getting another Riddler. And I mean, it's going to be very you're gritty. Deliver, you're never going to deliver the Jim Carrey, so you might as well go the other way, right? And like, that's, that's fair. Yeah, way it's Paul Dano. From the, yeah, Paul Dano. Like, it'll be like the cerebral, like, puzzle boxy Riddler. And then that's kind of a valid way to go, I think, too. It's fair. It, he, he honestly looks like the Joker to be in, in the trailer so far, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. I thought it was very entertaining that they figured out it was Bruce Wayne in part because they assumed it had to be somebody rich. I was like, that's <laughs> such a good deduction, <laughs> right? Because at the circus, he's like, I know Batman's in this room because Batman has to be fabulously wealthy. <laughs> does Riddler say spank me at one point? Yes. He does. A hundred percent, yes. I thought that's what he, he yeah, said. Yeah, he didn't dream it. No, you did okay. happen. I think he says it when he discovers the closet of secrets, actually. He yeah. Opens, <laughs> uses his cane to open the you closet. Know? And he's like, spank me, yeah. Wow, there's no symbolism at yeah. all. <laughs> the subtext is for cowards. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I tell you guys my crossover idea that I'm very passionate about? Please. Please. Uh, so the gays love this movie, too. <laughs> the live-action Scooby-Doo movie. <laughs> With this Batman, you know, would, would have been gold. Same energy. Yes. <laughs> Scooby and Batman have crossed before. Of, yeah, yeah, in the com- yeah, in the comics and the show, and the, there are some animated movies too. I think. Yeah, they could have started their own cinematic universe at that time. Been... Like missed opportunity because they were both Warner Brothers. It would have been fantastic. That's... That would, it would have, have been, that been is a way to bring good. Sarah Michelle Gellar into the Batman <laughs> mythos. Hey, you've discovered my my intention. <laughs> this is always TJ's intention. Always. <laughs> oh. How can I get Sarah Michelle Gellar into this? Okay, well, here's here's my question. If the studio came to you and was like, Sarah Michelle Gellar really wants to be in a Batman movie, mm-hmm. go write it. What would you do? Like, who would I Ooh. write like, who for is her? She? What is she doing? Yeah. Uh, you know what I would do? Again, we've already talked about the Telltale games. Do you care about a slight spoiler? No, I, I don't even, I don't know what they are. So you can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, in that game, spoiler for anyone listening, Vicky Vale is a character throughout the whole game. She's kind of a potential love interest uh, slash uh, friend to Bruce. And then near the end, you find out she is the villain mastermind. She's Lady Arkham. And it was just such a cool reveal. And I feel like mm-hmm. Sarah Michelle Geller would be brilliant in that, oh. like, bitch. I think you're right. Like, if you, Cruel Intentions is my favorite uh, after Buffy. 
Uh, and of course, Sarah Michelle Gellar is in both of those. And I think she would do a great job of mixing her Buffy persona and Catherine persona from Cruel Intentions um, to be a really mm. evil, um, seductive Bale. Lady Arkham. Yeah. Bale. I will say, so as much as I love Nicole Kidman and um, Chase Meridian in this, I will say some of her interest in Bruce Wayne is baffling to me because <laughs> their very first introduction is him just like mansplaining shit to her and going, you're naive but insightful. And she's like, <laughs> you know what I find hot? <laughs> when I'm gaslit by a man. <laughs> This is all four of these movies have this problem, right? Where it's like, why does anyone like Bruce Wayne? (laughs) Well, none of them come back for the sequels. Right. You know, you know, they might actually get to know him and be like, wait, I thought this was a teasing thing, but apparently you (laughs) Uh do think you're smarter than me is what's happening here. (laughs) Does he even have a love interest in Batman and Robin? He does, but you could not for the, I think it's Elle McPherson plays her. Oh, oh that's right. He like proposes or something. He some proposes bullshit. by a fireplace. Yeah, but it's the most yeah. preposterous. Can we, yeah. <laughs> can we talk about how he knows this woman for five seconds and he's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give up being Batman, tell her about it, and just change my entire life. Like, that's what his I'm going to do for this. <laughs> his whole plot in this movie is so bizarre. Like, He's it's recovering weird. repressed memories that seem not right. to be that not to be that traumatic, right? Like he's fine remembering <laughs> his parents dying, but he, he's like, and one time I fell in a cave. And it's like, ooh. <laughs> Schumacher wanted to make a Batman Year One movie, which is like why he was so into these flashbacks. Oh, well, yeah, there's a I mean- cut sequence where he fights with like a giant bat animatronic that you can still find of still of online. <laughs> <laughs> there, also can we talk about how uh, chase meridian finds his trauma flashbacks very attractive like she he like has a full ptsd flashback and she's like you know what i need to do right now bang him <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. again ma'am ma'am what is going on with your therapy practice I have no you question. fell in a cave tell me more <laughs> like, ew. You seem, <laughs> you seem to be panicking. Let's get into that. <laughs> yeah, that turns me on. <laughs> I love it when they get that distant, totally not here look in their eyes. <laughs> so who would you guys have picked at the end when it's between Chase and Dick? If you were if you were Bruce in that position, right. who would you have picked if you had to pick? Well, because I believe in protecting clients, I would save Dick Grayson and let the terrible <laughs> therapist fall. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I have my shallow reasons for picking Dick, but oh, I didn't even. I walked right into that one, didn't I? <laughs> yep. You Damn picked it. that Dick. It's, man, it is sure hard to. Don't have worry. Any I would also <laughs> pick Dick. I mean, that's the other thing. Like we were like, why isn't this guy Jason Todd? It's like. Not in a million years would Bill Schumacher let you change this character's name from Dick. <laughs> Not in a million great. years. <laughs> That's a great point. He's like, oh, it's even less subtle than I usually am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of things that like were interesting to revisit, I the moment when they die in the movie lived in my head from childhood to the point I could picture exact body placements of those dead Graysons. As soon as it popped up, I was like, oh, I think this was traumatizing. (laughs) Speaking of trauma, there's yours. (laughs) I I just have a, I have a Bruce Wayne like flashback, Chase Meridian's knocking on my door asking if I want to (laughs) fuck. That's Uh, on character for you, Chris. (laughs) <laughs> no, right. oh gosh <laughs> it is funny the way that i mean it is it is the, the one of the reasons batman is such a like iconic children's hero he's like his trauma is the scariest thing a kid can imagine right like yeah what if your parents died so like having that flash is always i remember the cartoon wasn't allowed to do it and you just see a shot of the rope cut and it swings into frame yeah. And it's like, mm. I remember that very traumatically. <laughs> As if that's better. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those Somehow things where the solution is infinitely worse. Yeah. That's that's like uh, Disney's Tarzan where they're not allowed to show the guy get hu- like hung by the vines. So they just show the shadow and it's like deeply terrifying. Yeah, 
or like in Psycho, where you never see the knife go in her body. And it's like, right. Like, it's just like 36 better. cuts in three seconds. And it's like, this is much worse. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think hmm. this movie and the one following it are in the same continuity as Tim Burton's movies? Yes. They kind like, of feel like okay. it, right? They explicitly, yeah. it, the, she has, Chase has a line where she says, do I need black leather and a whip, right? So that's- Yes, she does. Right. And it's the same Alfred, so. Right, and the yeah. same Jim yeah. Gordon. But besides that, like the city looks very different. All the other mm-hmm. recasts, like- It's just gotten a little bit of a purge makeover in between, that's <laughs> right. all. Just, there's, yeah. just, there's just ra- like a rave happening at all times in Gotham now. It's, they, they got new neighbors is what happened. Right. Like I, it, to me, it feels like a soft reboot, but it's, you know, it's intended to be a sequel. But with Michael Keaton coming back to the Batman yeah. franchise here soon, I'm kind of wondering if they're going to distance. If this movie version. still exists. <laughs> right. If they all good. Right. I think the only reason they would, the only reason they'd bring back anything from these is if Jim Carrey wanted another turn. Yeah. I think that's the only <sighs> element they would borrow. Yeah. Um. I don't think Schwarzenegger would ever come back. I don't think Uma no. Thurman, unless they did no. it for a joke, but none of them would want to joke about it, right? Like right. It something they, they did work hard on. So um, George Clooney just hates, <laughs> hates right. the whole experience. But then again, you could, if you give George Clooney enough money to buy another satellite or whatever, he will come in for a cameo. <laughs> so the man will do a Nescafe commercial. Like it's not... <laughs> God, I would love to see to Jim Carrey pop up in the Flash movie somewhere. Be amazing. Yeah, uh, I mean he's aged, but it. that's fine. Like yeah. the Riddler is, the yeah. Riddler is like has some kind of. There's some serious body horror at the end of this movie, by the way. Oh, <laughs> I know. What when happened? the Riddler like melts, it's like, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, okay. <laughs> now his brain is just full of bats, the same way Batman's is. Right. He tried yeah. weed and got really weird looking. He also <laughs> has suffered from these repressed memories that really do not seem that bad. <laughs> no. But his therapist is Chase Meridian. Get out, Joker. Get out. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Burton. Oh, that's the other thing, right? Like oh, Dr. No. Burton runs Arkham in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Uh, the la- I think the last note that I have that I have to mention is Bruce Wayne's turtlenecks. That's the whole note, but just like... <laughs> yeah, he loves a turtleneck. He I mean, he's amazing. uptight, right? Like he's... <laughs> it is they a fashion so that speaks to psychology. Him, <laughs> yeah. As a man without a neck, I don't know what it's like to look good in a turtleneck. But... <laughs> I don't think I've ever worn a turtleneck. You're not alone. I don't think I've ever worn a turtleneck either. Did we talk about the Rorschach test that was just a bat? Because Oh no, please do. Girl, that's a read, bat. <laughs> I love it so much when he walks in and he's like, why is this ink blot that shows your pathology a bat? And she's just like, sir. <laughs> <laughs> he's never heard of Rorschach tests before. But also he, she set him up because that thing is a bat. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Maybe you have bat on the brain too. Maybe. All I know is when they scanned his brain, all they found was a bat. That's right. <laughs> a bat flying right at the camera. Yeah, that shot was like right out of the Batman year one. It was comic. very funny though. Cause in a, in a comic, it has like an artistic quality. In this, it was like they looked in his brain and there's just a bat flying around in there. Just... <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. It's really just like, it's like a symbol of emptiness. <laughs> just a void with the bat it's like, it's like if you looked in your brain and it was just like the old cartoon of a guy playing an accordion like you know, like yeah like, like what what would yeah. ours be what would yours be if you went in that booth what would they see if, if i went in that booth they would be like wow tim drake huh just yeah that they'd is, say who's just, that yeah they would go which robin what not don't understand oh yeah what would it be for you tj and why is it buffy just, oh yeah just you got me. It would be Sarah <laughs> Michelle Geller. It's just her doing backflips in your brain. <laughs> yep. Anthony, what is your brain? What is your oh, brain, Gremlin? It would be it would be Chris O'Donnell in gray sweatpants <laughs> using his foot to ring uh, out a, ring out a towel. Why are you doing this? <laughs> what does it mean that I'm feeling these things? <laughs> Please don't stop. <laughs> yeah. He winks at the end too. <gasps> no. Oof. He uh, was trying to seduce Alfred. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah Alfred was... being there is so good. <laughs> There's not enough 
enough stories about people seducing Alfred. I'm just going to throw it out there. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have talked about this on your podcast before, but mm -hmm. I find it very funny whenever a back Alfred gets like a sexy lady backstory because it's like, this is the yes. gayest man <laughs> in comic book history. Like, yes. It at this point should be canonical. Like he's sure. literally a British spy. Like the number one qualification <laughs> for being a British spy is that you are a raging homosexual. <laughs> there, is, there is a version that in all other aspects is not a great comic that we talked about before called Gotham High but it is it is the one that has canonically gay and married Alfred yeah that otherwise that comic is terrible but then Alfred shows up with his husband and I was like yes yeah. he's gay and he drinks all the time it's <laughs> yes, great. He's gay and like, he has a drink in every panel just kind of like swooshing it around and I'm like okay I love it <laughs> <laughs> like I have very specific like, I actually am not a person who's like Batman is gay like I actually don't read Bruce as like I actually think he doesn't he probably doesn't manifest sexually in a lot of ways, but like his surrogate father, Alfred, the British spy turned <laughs> actor is a homosexual <laughs> man, right? <laughs> the, man, the man with a the theater degree who yeah. knows how to sew a bat suit. Yep, yep. And who's yep, like, you know what you need to use as a weapon is the theatricality. It's like, what? <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> we just posted an episode where we go into Chris's Batman is asexual headcanon. I think um, that's, yeah. uh, again, like it's one of those things where it's like the canon should almost be there, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, except for this movie version in which he is like very down at like, the whole movie. <laughs> right. I think it, <laughs> in general, he does have a sort of like, he's not motivated by sex. Like, and you, you can, I think some people have read that as repression, but I think he just isn't motivated by it. Like that's personally my head headcanon. Mm -hmm. Right. His yeah, I guess the difficulty is, is always that people will, mm -hmm. like, because you don't want to be like trauma equals asexual, yeah. right? So that's right. always the re weird, like, you, yeah. it's a tough line to it play It is a to. tough line, but also if we wait for a non-traumatized superhero <laughs> for a queer <laughs> representation, I'm just saying, we're going to be right. waiting. <laughs> or, it, or the other trope is like, the computer-brained one, they can be the asexual, right? right? It's true. It's true. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. but you're right. Like, you, what are you going to do? Just wait for a thousand yeah. years for the Yeah, for there to be a not traumatized one. Because... Now, which one of those is Jughead? <laughs> <laughs> right. Jughead? Jughead is not. See, I like J Jughead as in comics Jughead as Ace because he is just like, I want to eat hamburgers and be friends with people. And I'm like, say, right. bro, me too. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> and then at the end, there's that spotlight uh, with them running at the camera, Batman so and Robin. I love it. Did you think he was breaking up with Chase Meridian in that scene? Because I was like, huh, it seems like a breakup. And then she's like, call me later. And I was like, oh, okay. I didn't get that vibe. I got the, the impression that we understand this is exit Chase Meridian. I don't think right? anyone was like, I, I can't wait for Chase Meridian to come back in the next one, you know? Like, <laughs> he gives her. He gives her back her cultural appropriation doll and he's like, you know, I don't need this anymore. And I was like, oh, you're giving her back her things. Okay, right. she's leaving, this is goodbye. And then she's like, call me later. And I'm like, take a hit, girl. Like <laughs> well, especially since she has emphasized that the only reason she's attracted to him is his psychological breakages. <laughs> Right. She goes, she goes at one point, she's like, I'll bring the wine. You bring your mental scars. <laughs> Yikes. Wine in this movie. <laughs> it works yeah. on all of her patients. <laughs> it probably does. That's just it. <laughs> the reason she's not in the next movie is because she's in jail. <laughs> right. I mean, I do, like, I would have loved if Batman and Robin, like, there is actually, weirdly, a lot of sequences at Arkham Asylum mm. in Batman and Robin. So yeah, if like yeah. Chase Meridian had like hair up in a bun running the, the facility, I would have been yeah. fine with that. But no one is super invested in <laughs> OC do not steal Chase Meridian. <laughs> well, guys, what does your version of the better cut look like for Batman Forever? Because I'm me, I would probably have made him Jason. Let's just, just for maybe even just in a line <laughs> that he's, his real name's Jason, just for the five of us that care. And feel free to uh, self-indulge. <laughs> oh, well, I okay, but let me ask you then, if that's your take, is it possible really to have a Jason Todd story where he's the first Robin? 
Um, yeah, I guess the problem is in my version, this would have to have been the first movie. It can't be in the middle of the series the way it is, because I think it, it would have worked if there had been a Dick Grayson, but he's not in the picture anymore. And then this is the oh. Jason, right? So like some, there's like some framed pictures of like goofy, sweet little <laughs> Dick Grayson. Right. Yeah, beside all the sad parrot pictures that are stared at fondly oh. in this movie there's like a like a dick grayson and so jason comes in and he's like ah, i see you you adopt children all the time got it um you know just right. that kind of vibe i feel like it, it just jason is so much more in this character that i would have loved it if it was jason i mean he literally steals the batmobile jason's intro thing right, <laughs> right. Like, that's how jason comes oh in. i didn't think about it that's right <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> And like, I was like, we're big supporters of bisexual Jason on this podcast. Yes. And... So that's what I, that's my self-indulgence. I would have made it Jason and given maybe 10% of Chase Meridian screen time to Jason because there needed to be more, I think, of him mm-hmm. or Dick as it is in this one. That, that's how I'd change it. Also, she would get arrested in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> At the end, the malpractice suit that we have not seen is resolved. <laughs> They're very like, Chase Meridian, <laughs> you come, please come with me. <laughs> At the very end, she's like, Batman, call me. And she turns around and J- uh, Jim Gordon's just like, what if I call you instead? And then arrests her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what if he was like, by the way, I just called the cops. Start running. <laughs> He's like, I am deeply concerned by your practices. Yeah, she definitely has that like pull a cop's gun on him kind of energy. <laughs> Bruce, look so what I just delightful. shoplifted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then there's an after the credit scene of her just as a new villain. Just yeah. she's just a villain. Yes, now. that's yeah. how I would change it. I do think the film accomplishes what it wants to accomplish. You know, like yeah, there is no way to like. It is what it is, you know, like, and Mm -hmm. if you hate this kind of thing, fine. But part of me is like, I don't want to change it into a different kind of movie. The Mm -hmm. one thing I have sort of slightly said is that it does feel to me like it has taken literally one of the most psychologically complicated Batman villains, which is Two-Face. Yes. Completely turned him into like a B grade, like (laughs) no one really remembers Tommy Lee, like everyone was talking about Jim Carrey in this movie and yeah. no one is like Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face, right? Like, yeah, for sure. So part of me is like, it would have been kind of nice if these films hadn't started to default into two villains per film and mm. maybe given this character space to be something a bit more interesting than he was. Like, he, especially since he does have such a signature, like we, we talked about that scene of the divided apartment. It's like, visually he's super cool he pops on screen. There's a million yeah. things you can do with that. Like, it's like amazingly yes. overproduced aesthetic. Um, <laughs> yes. And which again, like the Nolan films are completely uninterested in, right? Like, yeah. what if his suit was kind of scarred is not interesting. Um, so yeah. I would have liked, I can imagine, I would have liked to see Joel Schumacher be interested in that character. Like another yeah. movie where it's like, show me more here. But I don't know. But then again, like you, sometimes that's how it is, right? Like sometimes you start a comic and it's like Batman's in the middle of stopping Mad Hatter, and it's like, okay, it's not a Mad Hatter story. Yeah, it's never but, gonna be a Mad Hatter story. <laughs> <laughs> so like you sometimes you need someone to be the flat background against which another character is foiled. My better cut of this would be I'm gonna self-indulge very much. Uh, yes. Just turn it into a sitcom with Riddler and <laughs> Two-Face, because that was the best part of the movie, I think. Uh, They're all over each other. They're all over each other. They have a Uh, lot of chemistry, which is hilarious, because Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones famously did not get along. Oh. They are good actors, then. Because there's a moment. No. No. Oh, so on set, Jim Carrey kept getting this vibe from Tommy Lee (gasps) Jones. And he's like, I can't believe you don't know this story because it's one of my favorite know. lines. This like I've ever gay heard vibe, and he tried to hook up with him. <laughs> it was like this hostile <laughs> vibe. Okay. And one day he's like, "Hey, hey, man, what's up?" And Tommy Lee Jones, it's burned into my brain what Tommy Lee Jones says. He said to Jim Carrey, "I just can't sanction your buffoonery." <laughs> and he said, a- "All righty then." Yeah. <laughs> what a terrific bird! Like. <laughs> 
sometimes you hear something that is so mean, but simultaneously so well said that you can't not appreciate it. I can I just see a Harvard like... Tommy Lee Jones. I think he's a Harvard. You... Do they teach insults at Harvard? <laughs> I can see it like playing out in my mind. Jim Carrey has the cane. He's like twirling it around, coming up to yeah. Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I can't and it doesn't show on screen. Your buffoonery. I cannot sanction your buffoonery. Just you know? so funny. How he and he he went on living after that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You didn't I would immediately eat die. 10 years before your <laughs> eyes. If someone said that to me, my eyeball would have fallen out of my head and popped. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I cannot sanction your buffoonery. I feel like I feel like I need to pull that out the next time somebody annoys me. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> the most savage thing I've ever heard. But on a, on a serious note, if, if if I wanted to change like one thing about this film, mm-hmm. um, I've loved the campiness. So like I wouldn't change anything about that or the vibe of the film. Good. But if we could have brought back um, Billy D. Williams as Harvey Dent from mm-hmm. that original film. Oh, yeah. Uh, instead of yes, buying yes. out his contract for Tommy Lee Jones, they should have just brought back Billy D. Williams. Is it still to this day the most anyone has paid not to be in a movie? Oh, I don't know. Because for a, a long question. time, a long time, it was the most anyone was paid not to be in a movie because his pay or play contract was so good um because they were just like of course he's going to be harvey dent right um and like that's a whole other story of imagine how complicated your feelings would be about like how you're like so rich now because you weren't in something like right (laughs) and like wild not to have him and to have like this i i mean tommy lee jones is a good actor but like a real waste in like why couldn't that have been uh, there's really- no reason yeah hmm. uh hmm. racism racism <laughs> know, is the mean, answer yeah, of course yeah. yes. there's no active <laughs> reason let's be clear there is right, no legitimate right. reason there is a big systemic reason how <laughs> <laughs> right but he did get to play two-face in the lego batman movie which yes. I, that makes me so I- happy I remember when all the articles came out that he was going to be uh, playing the in Lego Batman. I was like, yes, yes. Oh, so cute. Anthony, we have one final question that we ask oh. everyone that comes on our show. Okay. If you were given the opportunity to tell a Batman story or any character within the Bat family, what would that book look like? Or uh, just general themes if you don't want to go into too much detail? Oh, and this is in a world where there's no DC editorial to stop you. So go wild. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would want it to be queer. Yes. Um, it would be a very queer story. Go on. Um, I have I've always already signed up. Like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I try to I figure have... out how to subscribe, even though it doesn't exist. <laughs> I have like three directions I've always wanted to go in. Um, and two of them, maybe I can't talk about about but mm-hmm. i have always wanted to do the the tim con story we've always <gasps> yes! yes that superboy run is so Ooh. beautiful i would want to bring yes. um manipul back to do that that would be gorgeous and just like yes. i've really I've, i think it's time i mean we have so many robins how are none of them queer like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i really i am behind a a, a by jason todd that sounds absolutely mm-hmm. right to me it's very easy to do a by woman and like mm-hmm. good right. luck getting any kind of queer yeah. male representation in yeah yeah but i would like i think that's a story that seems ready to be told and like yes mm-hmm in some ways the many robinness is like let me have one you know (laughs) and there is like a fun it would be fun to like do a nice you know rehabilitation on jason todd or Mm -hmm. to do i mean there's so much fun to be had in the batman stuff i have like i have takes on like almost all the villains that i'd like to do this whole year i've been thinking about mr freeze it's like literally a man whose whole origin is bad health care ruined his life and you know? cost him the person he cares most about. And he is going to mm-hmm. make the world pay for it. And that is like, how is that man even a villain? You know, it's like the, the right. Poison Ivy meme 
kind of applies to all of Batman's films, <laughs> where it's like, that is not a bad guy. That is a guy who I absolutely want to see shatter the billionaire who ruined his life. You know? <laughs> Hashtag Mr. Freeze made some points. <laughs> Mr. Freeze was right. Where's Mr. my t shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Freeze was right. I mean, the the Paul Dini origin, the Heart of Ice from the cartoon is so quintessential, like one of the mm. top five Batman stories ever told. And like yeah. telling a Mr. Freeze story. Mr. Freeze is also one of the only heterosexual characters I'm ever interested in. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It's true. And he really is. There's, I, I can't even make him gay. I'm thinking about it. Just like so in love with his wife. I really hated when they did that thing where he, his wife didn't even know him for a while. And it was like- Oh, this, like, yes. I just one. read that one. It's so, uh, yeah, I didn't To like me, that. it's like the tragedy of it is so beautiful. And like the yeah. metaphorics attached to the visual, like he's literally a man in this free, this fridge suit. Like that's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It's just like such yeah. an icon. He hasn't had a good movie. He had the campy one, but it would be nice to do like a real story. So maybe we yeah. do a Tim Con thing where they fight Mr. Freeze. Maybe that's- I love it. <laughs> I love it. Someone on Twitter was saying, like, you might be familiar with these characters, Wiccan and Hulkling from yeah, Marvel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you heard of them? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have, do, you know, do you know who we're, we're talking about? <laughs> well, someone was saying that, um, you know, they're a big deal and DC doesn't really have <laughs> that going on right now, at least not that same- like archetype of characters, that relationship. And Tim mm -hmm. Khan could easily be that for DC. It's and it's really just kind point. of way right. to happen. It's I mean, I, I maybe only even got the Emperor Hulkling job because I've become kind of a theorist of the soft goth and the anxious, the anxious soft goth and the golden <laughs> yeah. retriever boyfriend. And like oh, Tim Khan is that model, right? It, yeah. A hundred percent. It's such a good point. So it's like, I mean, and the, DC kind of has it, but they have it in the ultra-violent way with like Apollo and Midnighter, right? Yeah, I was like, gonna um... say, it's like, that's the grown-up sort of, I mean, they're gritty, but I don't I don't like applying gritty to them because it doesn't feel right totally because they're also very sensitive and soft at times, so. Right, well, yeah. I, but like, even in, even in like Steve Orlando's hands, right? Where it's yeah. like the ultra-violence is like baked in, like part of their story arc is to get past the sort of violences yeah. of their past. What Absolutely. interests me about Tim Khan is like, their origins are kind of flipped, right? Like the mm -hmm. sweet soft one is the one with the really dark and compromised yeah. past. And the, the anxious soft goth is the one who actually was rescued from much darker. Like Tim, Tim Drake doesn't have the dark origin, right? Like that's kind of what's fun about him is like he's not yeah. Jason, he's not Dick, right? Like he kind of opted into this and tricked his way into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wa he wanted those. But I would, I have, have other stories I'd like to do, but mm -hmm. uh, those ones are those ones are more complicated, and I would have to divulge yeah. too much but that's and the big one where i'm like let me do this like that's the front facing one where i'm like please for the love of god <laughs> let's just do this thing that's been just waiting to happen make it so <laughs> now here's the thing though like what kind of because the thing with tim con is for me like who are they fighting what is the setting like that's always because they're they're sort of like long distance you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. So bringing them together would be part of the story, like putting mm -hmm. them. Maybe they're maybe they're roommates. Oh my god, there's only one bed. You know. Like, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so much. Now, are you that's a believer of, of like? Did they have a relationship in the past? And like, kind of like what they did with Richter and Shatterstar over at Marvel, mm. or like, would that would it be a budding new thing? I think this is just off the dome, but thinking mm -hmm. about it, like, as you said, DC has a more revolving door continuity situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with a couple that is geared this young. Yeah, I would want, and I've kind of done that. I've kind of done that with Wiccan and Hulkling, where it's like we never saw them get together, right? And I would mm -hmm. like to do a proper let's watch them. Oh. Let's do like a, an AU slow burn coffee shop uh, AU situation. No, I, <laughs> I have, my soul has left my body. I'm just. <laughs> you know, like it's been done. I've seen the established couple. I understand why in 2005, Alan Heinberg is like, they arrive together because it's mm -hmm. like, it's much harder for editorial to get in the way. But like, if we're going to do it now, I would want it to be 
you keep the energy from before like that's mm-hmm. still there if you read those comics you you like know this is the culmination of that but I wouldn't make it like a thing we missed it's time yeah. we were there for it you know and so to be clear in the coffee shop AU Superboy is the barista obviously and with Tim, those Tim, arms and Tim is the one coming in like because he has massive insomnia yeah so. this he sounds like the insomnia. next DC ink book he's got a la- <laughs> he's got a laptop covered in stickers yeah he's, he's, wor- he's working on his manuscript every day he definitely <laughs> has a hoodie and his nails are painted black just yeah so. can yeah. Tim have a Superman sticker on his laptop and Connor is like pissed <laughs> <laughs> I hate that man. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, my my dad slash whatever. Like, I don't even know. <laughs> One the of my own situation. Yeah. I don't know. Meanwhile, Tim only has it on there to annoy Bruce. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> <laughs> well, Anthony, that made my day. But besides you just too. being here in general, the fact yeah. that you brought oh, up this Tim was fun. so fun. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. that's absolutely. I mean, I. I'm very much a Batman guy. Like I definitely would love to do like a Superman thing, but Batman was the com. Like I grew up in the nineties, you know, like yeah. <laughs> Batman yeah. is my DNA. Like these movies yes. were my DNA. And it's like, um, so that would be the story I'd want to do is like the marriage of those two concepts together for sure. Love and it. it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been the of best. Of course. Where can our listeners find you online? Oh, um, I am on Twitter at Mia Koopa, terrible Latin slash Super Mario joke, M-E-A-K-O-O-P-A. Cool. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on. This yes. has been amazing. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you for brightening the quarantine oh. horror as it continues. Of course. Literally anytime. time. <laughs>